Hello everyone, and welcome to Dark Natter, the podcast where we slice, dice and dissect your favourite works of dark fiction. I, as always, am John Richter, and I am d- delighted, thrilled and honoured to be joined today by Isabel Blackthorne. Hello Isabel. Hello John, thanks for having me on the show. No problem at all, absolute pleasure via the miracle of technology from, uh, from uh, remind, remind me where exactly in the world you are right now. I'm in Victoria, Australia, so I'm not in Melbourne, I'm a little bit to the west. One of the coldest places in Australia I am. Oh blimey, right, okay, well I suppose that's festive for the time of year that we're recording at, which is good. Well it is, because other other parts of Australia are going to suffer a, a heat wave, but the forecast where I live is a nice 20 degrees, so that's, that's pretty good. Oh okay, good. okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. That, that sounds all right. That sounds all right. And, and it, of course, with, I mean, maybe it's just me, but I think other people probably do the same thing. You're aware of the existence of a country such as Australia. You're aware of the existence of various states and cities, but you don't really have a clue where they all are in relation to each other. So that was really helpful, actually. Thank you for the uh, geographical clarification. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> well, Isabel... Before we um, dive into uh, the, the sort of the meat and gristle of the show, uh, where of course um, you'll be recommending or proposing something for inclusion in our ever-expanding hall of pain um, for our favourite dark fiction works. But before we get to that, let's find out a bit about you. Tell us, tell us about yourself. Well, I'm a Londoner originally, and um, been back and forth living in Australia. I think oh, three, three, four times. I lose track and um, I started writing fiction about 10 years ago and uh, I caught the bug. It is a bug, isn't it? You, you can't stop once you start and uh, anyway, that's how it's been for me. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, well, I'm known to be prolific. I'm not a little bit, pro- how can you be a little bit prolific? You either are or you're not and I am. And Highly, um, highly love- prolific. <laughs> and I love writing all kinds of fiction. I like uh, stretching um, my skills, you know, just uh, a new new challenges I set myself. And amongst them all, um, dark fiction is something that I uh, gravitate towards every now and again and, and really, really enjoy it once I'm, you know, deeply involved in something dark, whether it's spooky or, or you know, gore. not too, so much on the gore side, but, um, yeah disturbing perfect well that's what we like to hear on this show of course and and it's an interesting point you tease out there about the um dark fiction ver- not versus gore because gore has its place but i think sometimes there can be an assumption made by people that when you talk about dark fiction and or maybe even veering into horror and i know both both you and i are not not so much horror writers although I, you know we dabbled at times it, people sometimes people can make that assumption that oh that yo you mean gory then and it well no not really so I, I it, we've talked before on this show about the, the, these kind of three you know three types of uh, horror for example is and, and the third you know that if the if the third type is the gross out where it's all blood and guts and you know limbs being severed the first type is a very kind of slowly ratcheting sense of dread and foreboding and not revealing that you know don't reveal the payoff. Um, and I kind of think that if, if you can exist, if your works can exist in that first space for as long as possible, or even just the entire of the work um, can exist there, then that, that, that's maybe where the, where the artistry is. And, you, you know, you, having said that, um, I, I know both you and I are not averse to having a, a few um, limbs removed here and there. Oh, no, I don't mind the odd limb removal, I have to say, John. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, the the book of yours that I most recently read was the Legacy of Old Grand Parks, which uh, which was ace. I loved it. It was dead good, and that was um, I, I, we sort of met online uh, and you know exchanged books and exchanged ideas and um, and and it's always interesting, isn't it, reading something by a new writer for the first time, especially someone you've spoken to. And yeah, that book to me that was a like a perfect example of that. It was person gets stranded in remote rural town. The locals are all weird and uh, creepy, and you know something is going. Oh, not all of them, maybe all of them in different ways, but you know something is going to go amiss. Something's building; it's building towards some unpleasantness, but you have no idea what it is, and so you have this sense of uh, almost like being deliciously uncomfortable as the reader, as as you keep turning each page. So um, yeah, I thought I thought that was a tremendous book. 
thank you. That's a lovely, lovely description of it. That's nice. And that you remember it because it's a few months ago since you read it too. Uh, well, it, it is it definitely stuck with me. I think I um I was I was doing a bit of sort of blogging and stuff at the time and uh, or having having a go at that. So I I, I think I even um, posted a review of it because I enjoyed it so much. But um, you did in, you did indeed. It, it's interesting, isn't it? The world of um, without veering off topic too much, but that 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 world of of sort of writing that we both exist in. There is this um, you know, you write a book. You fulfil your dream of getting a publishing contract. You, that's the that's the sole thing you've you, maybe not in your case the sole thing, but that's that's a a thing you've always wanted to achieve, and it is that and it and it then happens, and that's great. But then you learn that there's this whole other world of oh, right now I've got to promote it, and I've got to try and um, you know get get my books in front of an audience, and there's so many different options of how one can do that. Um, uh, you know, re- reviewing other people's books, blogging about them, uh, po- you know, social media. Um, I, I guess it, to an extent, even even you know, obviously your your appearance on this podcast hopefully will bring you some uh, some attention. That, that was my goal, but it, it can be a bit daunting, can't it? It's where do you start? Absolutely, where do you start? And the, and when you've got your you, you have your debut novel out, it's so exciting. You face all of this for the first time. You you give it your all. You know you do book launches, radio, podcasts. You get you do everything. But when you've come to your thirteenth or your fourteenth book, yes, you and I, you know, oh, you just think, oh, no, I don't think I can be bothered to launch this. Who's going to come? The novelty is completely worn off, and you go through the motions of, of, um, okay, I'm going to promote it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that, and it becomes, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a chore. It just becomes. Um, you get a bit jaded, I suppose. It becomes hard. Yeah, work. It, it's not the. I guess in some ways, the, the reason you know the reason you and I are writers and lots of other people are writers is because they, we like writing. We're not marketers or promoters or social media experts, and, and I guess as a result, um, although that bit has a, as you say, a degree of novelty at the first, you know, the first time or even the second time. It, yeah, it's really the thing you want to spend your time doing is write is writing more books. So it's great that you're still able to do that and achieve such a, as you say, such a kind of prolific output. How, how many books have you written, Isabel? I think it's 13, 14, 14 now. Brilliant. I've got one coming out, The Ghost of Villa Winter. And uh, it's not it's not dark, dark, but it's dark. Well, t- t- tell us a little bit about it. Obviously, um, you'll, uh, I suspect you won't want to go into spoiler territory, but yeah, t- t- tell us a little about your next, uh, your upcoming release. Well, this one is set in the Canary Islands. I'm ri- I write a Canary Islands um, mystery series, and this is book four, and it's set in Fuerteventura in a secret Nazi base. And this secret Nazi base actually featured an, a documentary recently. I think it was the BBC. It might not have been. So, um, And uh, there's all kinds of conspiracy theories around this base. And I thought it would be a really good setting for a murder mystery. And I... And I Brilliant. You know the difference between plotting and pantsing. I, I, <laughs> yeah, it, oh, I'm not sure we've um, you know I'm not sure we've actually covered this on the show but uh, we should we should probably uh, clarify that I'll uh, I'll have a go at it I mean plotting is I always think of it as plotting is what you're supposed to do which is you know like post-it notes with with bits of the story scribbled on and detailed chapter by chapter synopsis and character biographies and you know bits of coloured string linking across your room all the different ideas whereas pantsing is like oh sod it I'm just going to dive in and just write it and see see what turns out which is probably closer to what I do to be honest yeah absolutely and me too so I had a couple of characters and I had the setting and I kind of figured out how I was going to get my characters to the setting and then I pantsed it from there and I got a fair way Perfect. in before I, <laughs> I hit a wall and needed to do some serious plotting. You get to a point where you can only pant so far and then you have to plot because otherwise, it's always, yes. It, no, I was just going to say it's always really reassuring to hear uh, someone who has a similar approach to me because it's because I think, and again, you, your experience may be different. What happens to me is 
I'll be sort of, you know, oh, I've just finished the book and I've got no more ideas. Oh, will I ever write again? Oh, woe is me. And then suddenly <laughs> y- your idea strikes and you're like, oh, oh, I'm excited again. Brilliant. Uh, but the idea will be something quite, it's not It's not the idea for a fully fledged plot. It's just the idea for, like you say, a setting. And you're right, I've got a set. It's going to be this genre. It's going to be a whodunit and it's going to be in this location. Brilliant. Can't wait to write this. But that's not actually enough for a book. <laughs> but you just dive in because you're so excited, you know? <laughs> yes, I know exactly that. And you, I can um, quite often get to about 12,000 words and then I dry up. And that's how a book takes a year to write because you pick it up, you put it down, you things happen, that's, you that's have more be. ideas and so on. So I've actually got three novels on the go at once at the moment for precisely this reason. I, p- I push one forward for a bit, set it aside pick up the next one the other one you know and so I go and that's it that's really interesting I, I I mean it's it's funny it's so similar to my own experience I, I had, it, last year I managed to write a book last year which is now coming out next year which is great congratulations but I also started well thank, thank you very much thank you thank you um but but and that's a bit of a bonkers techno thriller um, so yeah Wonderful. watch the space for some more information on that one but the, uh, before that, I had a completely different idea, different setting. It was like a sort of a Victorian sort of sort of fantasy anyway. And and it, ex- I think almost exactly the word count that you said, about 12,000. And I got to that point and then I was like, eh, mm, and it just sort of dried up and that's it. It's been shelved for, for, for you know, since then for about 10 months. Um, and it, as you said, who knows, maybe that'll get dusted off again or maybe it'll just stay on the shelf gathering dust and uh, I wonder yeah got, so maybe the question to you should not, should not just be how many novels have you written but how many unfinished novels have you still got in the uh, in the works oh you know I do like to use up my stuff so if I've got something sitting there that's only that length you know 12,000 words um, I quite often will find a way of getting that into into a, another novel so, you know I, sometimes it can be like a well, it's kind of magical, like our creativity is is uh, a deep thing. Like we're not completely in control of it. Like we're in, we're have inspiration which comes to us, and um, then we have our imagination, which is how we write the stories. But then there's something sort of deeper than that. That the muse, the muse, you know, and it's almost as if there's a hidden agenda at work. Like the combination of the muse and the inspiration and all this stuff, it all sort of happens independently of me. Anyhow, I'm just the servant. Oh, that's fascinating. It's, it's really interesting to hear how people describe this the whole experience of, of sort of having an idea or a set of ideas and then managing to convert them into reality. And, it, and I, I imagine, it sounds like there are some similarities between you and I, but I think there are probably people who are experiencing it in you know, a completely different way. And that, you know, they're sort of constructing it out of thin air almost like a you know an architectural almost like an engineer um but yeah my, mine is, is is more like it's certainly very similar to the kind of process you've described well i call my muse her downstairs oh because <laughs> she, she's buried she's buried deep within somewhere she is and her downstairs but i she does present herself to me i i can see her face and um oh I think really she, oh yes oh yes and she has a filing cabinet, I think. Oh, that, I love this. This is this, this is great. The thought of me exploring this thought process and wondering what um, my my version of that would look like is quite a scary one. <laughs> it's some sort of, you know, like monstrous, misshapen sort of... You, know, you live in a cave, I suspect. It could well be, but it's very... It's worth getting to know because... Um, this 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 um, what do, would you call it a sub personality or something or other I don't know we could get all Jungian about it I don't know uh, it's not the shadow it's something else and it is worth conjuring um, conjuring this uh, this mu- inner muse because uh, over the years and decades this um, inner being transforms doesn't stay the same at all my mind has transformed. Um, from this wi- wild woman with, you know, sort of something out of Wuthering Heights, you know, in a, in a <laughs> scarlet ball game, gown, running barefoot through castles. She was absolutely rampant. It was very difficult to contain her and to contain her energy. She would just flood my being. 
And then over the um, a decade of engaging with her, she's actually changed. She's gone corporate. She had to sort of get it, you know, put a shirt and tie on and get a sensible haircut. And yeah, get, yeah, and she's get got a job this in an office. insanely wild grin still. Like she's insanely happy, obviously, because I've, you know, she, I'm giving her what she wants, which is f- freedom of expression. And she wears large, like, reading glasses, and she looks like one, you know, a, a, a sort of corporate suit type. She's completely interesting. changed. Completely interesting, interesting, and, and that, that 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 this thing about change, your your inner sort of um, you know that voice or your, your your source of inspiration changing over time. That that's that definitely rings very true. It, it sometimes you look back at. I'm sure again, this is common across other writers. You look back at something you've written and think, "God, oh, I'm glad I wrote that because I couldn't write that now." Because th- there's no way I I would I, I don't think in the same way my brain's you know rewired itself so it's a it's a good job I wrote that at the time otherwise it could just never exist. Oh, absolutely true. One of mine, the cabin sessions. This is a very dark, very intense um, work of. Well, I suppose it's a thriller, but I was I tried to write horror, but I ended up writing a thriller. But I can be excused though, because it did get absolutely, nom- absolutely. It got nominated for the Bram Stoker um, 2018, I, I think it was. So oh, it couldn't fantastic. have been... Yeah, so it must have had some horror in it. But I was waking up talking about her downstairs. She had me up at four o'clock in the morning through the winter. And I was writing uh, by hand then. I don't do that now. And I, was, I had this character which um, just um, took over the narrative... And I would journal what she was, she was uh, thinking, and as she was kind of taking over the story, and the stuff she came out with. Oh gosh! I mean, the, disturbed the reader, it disturbed me, you know. But I thought, well, you know, she, she said it. I kind of have to go with it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And she sounds like quite a sort of um, formidable character. You wouldn't want to mess her about. So I think I think that was probably very wise. She really wanted to get stuff off her chest. Well, well, maybe she will make an appearance over the course of today's episode. We will see. Ooh. We will see. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is great. This is let's let's set up. You see, that's set up a hook now. So uh, the people, people, be, um, any listeners will be, uh, you know, suitably. You know, what's the word? Suspenseful. Um, well, one uh, other area of suspense that we try to conjure up for this show is uh, when our guest brings a, a favourite work of dark fiction, whether it's a book or a writer or a movie or a video game or a play or a... We've even had a fairground ride in the past. Um, and the, 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 the challenge, of course, is for the um, guest to convince me uh, and my uh, usual co-host, Liam, who's not with us today, as the custodians of the um, of the honour of the Hall of Pain, of whether this item is worthy of a place. Uh, and of course, the suspense is completely undermined by the fact that everything that's ever been proposed ever has always got in. Um, and, I, <laughs> and I suspect that the thing you're proposing is it has, a, has a strong chance because it is it is a writer that I uh, that I love myself and have read almost everything he's ever written. Um, but uh, Isabel, I will let you tell us what you're bringing for discussion today. Well, the author Ian Banks. I, I, ah. I cannot you know, talk to you, John, without mentioning Ian Banks. And my favourite novel of his, although it's very hard to say that, but it's the first novel I ever read of his, The Wasp Factory. And I read that novel pretty much after it was released in the 1980s. And I never forget it because I was living in London. I was living in a squat in Stockwell. Mm-hmm in a room with a mattress on the floor with an old hippie for a boyfriend. And, wow. um, yeah. Close to where I live. I'm, I'm elephant and castle based, so yeah. not, not, not too far away. Round the corner from you. Just off Wandsworth Road, I was about about 100 metres from that great big Sainsbury's that's there. Oh, so that, so that yeah. That is that is a, that is very close to me. Then in that case, you, you yeah, we could have we could have probably had a we could have done this if you still lived in your old place. We could have done this recording, you know, shouting across the rooftops to each other. I <laughs> well, it was a perfect place to read um, the Wasp Factory. It really was, um, and 
that book just blew my mind and his style of writing and the way that he uh, handled that story with the incredible twist at the end that you just can't yeah. see is coming was fantastic the thing even today and this is like nearly i don't know this is 35 odd years later i remember the wasp factory itself and the rats mm. the rats on the dead rats on sticks uh, you know guarding his territory yeah there's, there's there's so much kind of um and that's that's that that thing about remembering sort of specific things and images and, and of course you know a book is just some printed words on a page there's no usually not any visual imagery pictures associated so the fact that you remember it in that visual way is testament to how well crafted those images were but m mine is probably the actual wasp factory itself so the um in in this particular novel just just to quickly re sort of recount the plot it's it tells the story of a kind of a, a psychopathic teenage boy who lives on a, a scottish island um and it, you know un has a number a number of troubles in his past that have led him to be the the character he is today and he, he has this kind of fiendish creation of the wasp factory which is like a, a sort of a clock face with like a hole at each of the 12 hours and he inserts wasps into it and behind each of these 12 entrances is a different death for the wasp and I can I can visualize that clock and all those kind of traps around the edge you know even now really kind of vividly that's a fantastic summary of the book that's brilliant I, I, and what a, what an imagination and the reviews in the beginning as well where he he got some spectacularly bad reviews so the publisher put them in at the front end pages to promote the book i think it worked that's genius i i read i was in a bit of doing a little bit of research before we recorded i was reading i think it was the was it the irish times called it a work of unparalleled depravity <laughs> and of course I, they probably meant that as a criticism but to me that's like oh, all right then i'll read that that sounds great so I, I think using that as promotion was genius it was it was and what i liked about um, what I love about Ian Banks is that well, he's got a, a particular style, hasn't he? And it, and it, it yeah, developed definitely. it as he developed as a writer. He he started to write to his audience. So I feel that his later works were very much oriented towards uh, guys that like gadgets and you know modern technology and fast cars. <laughs> Yeah, you know. it's it's interesting that video games cropped up a bit in some of his books and and, and sort of gaming. So I remember because I am you know it's almost like stereotypical nerd. So I'm a big I play board games, I play video games, all that stuff. And I remember I think there's a, I can't remember which of his books it is, but there's a fictional video game that's fun. You know, it, it, there was a lot of stuff about like Scottish. A lot of his books were about these like rich Scottish families. With and all the, the troubles that the family had had over the years, and the deceit and the deception and incestuous goings on, and one of them, I think, the reason for this big empire, this big empire had been built on the foundation of some famous video game, um, and I re the detail he went into describing the ins and outs of this game and the trading mechanics and what you did, as you're reading it, you'd almost think, oh, that he, is he, he must be talking about a real game that really exists, but nope, just completely made it up himself out of thin air. Fantastic. What an imagination. He was taken from us far too soon. Yeah, t totally agree. Uh, may maybe just to, to quick for the benefit of, um, of anyone who, who's unaware of Ian Banks. So Ian Banks was a, a Scottish writer. Um, his first novel, which was The Wasp Factory, as you say, was published in 1984. He went on to write, I think, speaking of prolific, he went on to write just under 30 novels, which is an incredible output and, again, such high quality until his sad death in 2013. Um, and I just got, you, you take him for granted, don't you? I just got, it, he was my favourite, he is my favourite writer. And I just was, I'd read, I've read almost everything he's ever written. And I was just used to there being a new book every year, a new Ian Banks book or an Ian M. Banks book, as we'll come on to in a second. And then suddenly that's it, he's you know, that the output has ended and it, that, it is really sad. And then suddenly you realise how lucky we were to have all of that great literature to, to consume over the last few decades. Absolutely. And I remember, I'm just trying to cast my mind back to which novel I drew inspiration from Banks for. I think, I can't remember the name of the novel, but I know that when I first started out writing, um, I studied 
the way that Banks uh, moved through scenes, the way that he described oh. characters, the way uh, the, his use of jump cuts, uh, that really did inspire mm. me. Um, he's very, very good at it. And so I learnt a lot from him. Th- that jump cuts thing, yeah, I, I completely agree with that. It's, it's, he's, he wasn't afraid to, you know, a scene with some characters, some stuff happens, the next chapter might be some completely different characters and it, all the same ones but at a completely different time and he certainly wasn't afraid to sort of jump around the chronology as well as the, the people and the settings so some of his books could be quite tricky to follow but equally that I, I, I sort of found that a rewarding experience it was almost you know challenging you to sort of keep pace with his imagination in some ways and and make sure you were sort of staying staying afloat in terms of what oh, was definitely. happening and and all came together at the end yeah definitely although i d- he did lead the reader he didn't do these sort of random cuts you know that sometimes you read a novel and you mm. think why that should have been a new chapter or something you know and um, yeah, yeah, he yes. he was very careful to lead the lead the reader there was always a logic or something or other that you know indicated it was um things were shifting or one part had come to an end and then another was starting i loved walking on glass and brilliant yeah. oh i think that was his second was that his second book if i remember rightly i think I, that was another kind of early one um and yet again it's the whole thing of having three storylines stephen grout wasn't it stephen grout was he the bloke who thought that there were lasers the cars going past on the road had laser beams coming out of the wheels so he had to sort of time it so that he was kind of hidden behind a lamppost as each one went yeah. past. He had all these troubled, psychologically damaged characters that were sort of brilliantly detailed. Absolutely. And then there was the, the, the castle. The walking on glass was the was the castle. And they had to they were playing a game and they didn't know the rules, wasn't that it? They had to figure out the. It's it's funny as well, just you mentioning it, and I'd not I hadn't thought of this for years because I read it a long time ago. But I just I remember distinctly one of the features of this game of the castle was that there were these little I don't know little kind of elves little small monstrous little creatures that were sort of the attendants and I think one of the characters that they were wearing these little things were wearing like masks and I think one of the characters kind of grabs one of them because he's you know trying to get frustrated desperately trying to figure out what they're supposed to do pulls the mask off and there's just another mask underneath pulls that off another mask and just keeps and he's just masks all the way down until there's just a bundle of rags in his hand the creature's just not there there's nothing there and that was quite a, a sort of disturbing unsettling image another one that's um, just just sort of popped up definitely um a master for uh for aspiring authors He's he's yeah. he's he's easy to read. He's easy to unpack how he how he um, puts his novels together, how he constructs his narratives. So I, yeah, I, I just think I love him to pieces. So so well written. Speaking about the um, the sort of interesting structures to some of the novels, there was it, it's funny, isn't it? You have a, you you can have a favourite book and then. Sometimes it's a bit futile, isn't it? You know, you have to have a favourite book and a favourite movie and a favourite... I, I sometimes fall into that trap of liking to have a favourite a favorite thing. Uh, and one of my... I think my, my long... T- it, it was my favourite book for a long time. It's It's been recently superseded uh, by House of Leaves by Mark Danielewski, which is one for another day and another podcast. Um, but it, my favourite book for a long time, and certainly my, my favourite Ian Banks book, was one of his Ian M. Banks books. So it... Ian M. Banks was his kind of science fiction alter ego. Um, and, and as a quick aside, I think Ian Banks, before he was published, he'd, had a, he'd written a few sci-fi novels that were rejected, as happens to a lot of writers. You get a lot of rejections and then finally a breakthrough. And so he wrote, apparently he wrote The Wasp Factory to, deliberately to try to be a bit more conventional, because obviously it's a kind of real world setting. But because of this remote island and this central character who was a psychopath certainly a very unusual person. Banks said, in a way, that was still sci-fi because the island was like the universe and the, the, the central protagonist was like an alien. So that, that I thought, was a great little quote. Um, he sort of wrote sci-fi by stealth. Brilliant. I didn't know that. I loved Against a Dark Background. That was a very easy, oh, yeah. pretty straight-ahead read. And um, I managed to get to the end of Accession. Good, well... You you won't believe this. That was the first book of his that I ever read. Oh no! <laughs> 
which, <laughs> which is one of the most impenetrably dense, blooming, hard to follow books. But I loved it. I did like it. So it, you know, I didn't. It didn't put me off it, I, for whatever reason. Stupidly, I read. I read everything in the wrong order, and I read Accession the very first what? when I was about twenty. What an introduction to Ian Banks. That's incredible. <laughs> I would. I would recommend anybody who's interested in Ian Banks to start off with. Um, complicity or yes um, yeah i think yes. complicity would well be, said yeah it's yeah it, it, i think if you were going to do the e&m bank sci-fi stuff you'd start with consider phlebus the, the first one um you, in a way that almost sets the history of the universe that he then goes on to explore with the culture which is this sort of future uh, civil you know universally dominant civilization that acts almost as like the police force it's a bit like america in the 80s and 90s maybe in a way but yeah consider Phlebus was the first but yeah Ian Banks um, his non-sci-fi complicity what that is a blooming masterpiece I think uh, the guy in the the leaky hotel <laughs> there's a scene in there that really makes me laugh but I won't I think you might know which one it is but I, I won't oh, yeah. oh, not on air <laughs> not on air we'll keep it clean <laughs> just go and <laughs> just go and read the book <laughs> yeah I I, I, I know the scene and I can uh, fully uh, concur with your assessment of it. It is a it is a funny it is a funny scene. People getting their comeuppance um, in different ways in that book. <laughs> um, I, 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 I was going to um, talk about it before I uh, t- t- waylaid myself um, in terms of story structure. So my favourite book was Use of Weapons, which is one of the Ian M. Banks books. Uh, I don't know if you've um, read that one, Isabel, but the way that works is. And it takes you a little bit to figure this out. It's got alternating chapters. The first chapter and then the third and then the fifth and so on are, are sort of conventionally numbered and and chronological. The second chapter, the fourth, the sixth, the eighth, are Roman numeraled and in reverse. So what you realise is it's telling you the story from the start, you know, a young man doing stuff in order, but then it's telling you him in the future as a old bonkers you know embittered some, something clearly has happened to turn him from this honorable young you know person to this completely ruined person in the, in the at the end of his life but it's telling you that stuff backwards so the climax of the book is you finding out what happened in the middle and oh. learning what the event was that to me i thought that was again just a stroke of brilliance really of how to how to structure a book in a different way. Oh, isn't that fantastic? Goodness me. And that he really is experimental with structure and makes a really good study for uh, f- for all of us, really. It doesn't matter where you're at in your writing career um, or your reading career, for that matter. It's yeah, Ian Banks is uh, a must read. Can you um can you think of any other of, uh, of his works or p- aspects of his writing that have maybe inspired some of some of your stuff? Yes, I have to say the bridge. In the bridge, there is a little parallel narrative that kind of creeps in. It's in Scottish dialect, and it's a a, a kind of almost a, a comic rant set, um, I don't know, way, way back in time. I'm a bit hazy on the details, but I'm doing the same thing with this one of the works that I've got on my desk at the moment, which is the dark work. Mm. And I'm taking that idea and working it into my story as a kind of metaphoric way or a way of kind of paralleling the drama that's going on in the supposed real world. Yeah, fantastic. So that's that's almost like um, you're almost using snippets from from this from this dialogue to sort of punctuate the the piece and kind of work alongside it. Yes, yeah, sort of. I was trying to figure out in terms of structure how I should do it because the story is really complex. It's got three um, time periods. The main character is the same person in each reincarnated. Um, so it's got an es- it's got an esoteric flavour to it, and there's another theme running through it, which is channeling. This um, it's um, no, you're never quite sure who is actually receiving this higher wisdom, and that 
is runs through the narrative as well. So in terms of writing it, it's going to be very interesting. I, I get the feeling, for example, that Ian Banks inserted that after he'd written the story. Interesting. Yeah, and, yeah, and sometimes you and you, you sometimes you you can form these conclusions and they turn out to be wrong, but yeah, you, you can sometimes see, can't you, when you're reading someone else's book, you can sometimes see evidence of their editing process and you think to yourself, oh, that, that looks like a bit of a vestigial remnant of some other subplot that then got <laughs> axed. Or it, It's sometimes interesting to kind of make those observations. Absolutely. And when you're writing, or at least for me, it's a kind of tunnel vision thing to start with. Um, I write uh, the dialogue and the action and move through scenes and I try and get as quickly as I can t- through to the end of the either the novel or that, that section. So, you know, if I've got three time periods, I want to write the first time period until I get to the end and the second one from beginning to end in one hit and then you expand mm. out from there. But it you can't you can't write write a multi layered story, you know, oh halfway through chapter three, oh I'm gonna insert that bit about, you know, blah blah and then come back. It doesn't work like that. No, it, it's or or again I suppose different people have different processes, but it certainly seems if you were gonna you, your book sounds fantastic by the way, it sounds really, really interesting. The reincar the, the same person reincarnated multiple times, that is a that is a great idea. It, it seems to me like the logical way to write that would be to do one whole story in one of the characters, finish it, then do the next one, then do the next one, and then decide how you want to splice it together. Yeah, but, and then, but again, and then it, figure out... Yeah, and then, and then kind of figure out as well, um, not just um, how it's all going to fit together, but then you'll be tinkering with it, you know, as you go along. It's like with crime writing. Um, you often put little plot twists and clues in afterwards you go back and insert them you 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 work in the little themes after you finish the first draft you go back it's not like you have the whole thing all at once preconceived if you do that that way you run the risk of not being able able to write the book if you over plan it and overthink it then that kind of stifles your creativity so to a certain extent you have to allow yourself the the freedom to enter the flow and let your creativity go where it wants to have the inspiration get to the end then fix everything up afterwards yeah but to c- completely agree with that it, it and i think that's the almost going back to earlier in the conversation about sort of plotting versus pantsing there could there's probably some people listening thinking well why would you ever not do the detailed plot get it all sorted completely locked down and then write it the reason is exactly what you just said because you just get bored and you just get too snagged up in little minor plot details or things you can't figure out and you'd never write anything if you didn't sort of dive in and get going absolutely because your creativity the creativity is a living breathing entity and that wants freedom of expression so if you um you f- you put it in a straitjacket if you you know say oh well you know you it's like writing to order you you know it's like painting by numbers or something oh i suppose i've got to color this square yellow that's what she wants uh yeah the next you know the next paragraph's got to be like this oh okay it's oh takes all the joy out of it yeah and 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 as, and as you say you can always go back and um dare I say, almost artificially introduce some of that artifice. So yeah, in a crime novel, you know, there's a big twist and it turns out that the killer carries a flower around and, oh, and that's why there was a rose petal left on the ground. But you might only think of this idea about the flower right at the end when you're writing the finale. But then there's it's, it's very easy to then just go back and sprinkle a few flower petals into the book and make it look like you had that idea all along. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's exactly it. Yeah. Was it? I think it was Neil Ga- Neil Gaiman who said. Um, it, it, I think it's in one of the adverts that keeps popping up on YouTube. You know, for these master classes where it's like really famous, recognisable celebrity teaches an online course about stuff. So you know, David Lynch doing a course about film or whatever, which sounds amazing. I think Neil Gaiman says your second draft is the process of making it look like you knew what you were doing when you wrote your first draft. <laughs> yep. Which that ring, that sounds rings, about right. Yeah, that was that'll definitely be the case with this this big um, 
dark, esoteric thriller that I'm writing. I've, I've, I know the, what the murders are going to be, though. I've got, I know the murders. That's the most important thing, uh, after all. I was going to say, I would expect nothing less. I imagine that was the first thing you came up with, was the, uh, the specifics. Yes, of the, the murders uh, and the motives... Definitely, yep. Oh, it sounds it sounds brilliant. I, I well, we eagerly await the first and indeed the second and whichever draft it ends up on. But the final product will be tremendous. So, uh, looking crossed. forward to hearing more about that. <laughs> well, Isabel, we have. Is there anything more on Ian Banks that um, we have failed to cover, or shall we move to the the final assessment of uh, Ian's place, the potential place in the Hall of Pain? I think we've covered a lot about Ian Banks already. Let's go to the final assessment. Let's do it. And, and it's, it's interesting, I'm just looking at my notes, one of the notes I'd made was, oh, must talk about complicity. And you covered that one anyway, un, unprompted, because that, yeah, that's that was probably my favourite too. Brilliant. Um, well, yes, in summary then, if maybe if you could give me your sort of elevator pitch for... Why is Ian Banks great and why does he deserve a place in the uh, hallowed halls of the Hall of Pain? Oh, Ian Banks, an incredibly brave, innovative, experimental writer, cuts to the chase, doesn't mind a bit of gore, is funny and um, prolific. What else can I say? (laughs) Brilliant. Perfectly summed up. And... uh, you will be um, relieved to, to learn that I uh, can confirm uh, absolutely, definitely, without a doubt, <laughs> Ian Banks is, uh, is going into the Hall of Pain. We, we haven't quite figured out the specifics of the Hall of Pain. We think it's, it's kind of like a dungeon, and we think that the people who are, um, uh, the, the works or the people that are permitted entry, you know, they get their own cell. Uh, and I suppose we should we should probably sort of feed them periodically and check in on them. Um, but so, yeah, Ian Banks, is, he is certainly getting his own... Uh, his own his own cell with a plaque on the outside and Definitely. copies of all his books as Copy, well absolutely absolutely have to have for the, of all his for the other inmates to i'm trying to think how many writers have got in so far i think it might only be stephen king and and now ian banks we've had a few individual books so dracula is in but dracula's you know he's almost like a pan media global recognizable phenomenon isn't he not not just the book Yes. Um, so yeah, it's the the writer's wing of the Hall of Pain is probably quite quite thinly populated. So Stephen King will be oh, glad dear. he's got a, someone he can talk to now. He's got a writing buddy. Oh dear, they might cook up a book. Can you imagine that? Actually, can you imagine Stephen King and Ian Banks? What would emerge from that partnership? I'd, oh. I would definitely read it. I think you might have to write the novel. <laughs> that's, well, there's a, there's a challenge. Stephen King is still Stephen King is still alive, though, so it might be better if there, it was a posthumous thing for both of them, you know. And then that's a good point, actually. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll wait wait till they can both do it from the sort of the you know the nether world uh, or whatever wherever they'll both They'd end love up. It. Well, They'd the absolutely pain. love it. Yeah. Um, I read something once that Stephen King co-wrote with some other bloke. It's called oh, I think it's called. Black House, and it's Pete, Stephen King and Peter Straub, which I'm maybe mispronouncing. And I just remember the killer in that book is a really, really old man in an old folks' home who all the nurses think is, you know, he's got dementia and he can barely speak and he regularly soils himself. But then at na- it's all an act, and at night he goes out and murders people. Oh, no, <laughs> thought, that's fantastic. <laughs> is it a comedy? Thought, it's so dark. It's... It's definitely got comedic elements, but um, it's uh, yes, it's, it's, it's a funny one, isn't it? That that fine line between dark comedy and you know, p- people have different thresholds for what they would consider funny. I suppose that's absolutely true, and I think with um, dark comedy, the creator is usually the one with the tears streaming down their face. That is what I've discovered. Yeah. <laughs> I find <laughs> I find it, it, when I was writing. Um, all of I wouldn't say all of it, but certainly Grand Parks and the Cabin Sessions. There were scenes in there that that did trigger that kind of reaction. I just laughed so every time I yeah. read that bit back. I was editing it or anything. I would just lose my, you know, I'd just be cry, crying with laughter. And I don't think a reader ha- had that same reaction. You know, I don't. I, I don't know. Maybe somebody has the same warped sense of humour as me. There's something about 
writing it down and reading it back. It's, I wouldn't call it self-indulgent. It's very spontaneous and it's very, very good fun. <laughs> it's great fun. <laughs> yeah, but, but I agree with you about that thing of sometimes you, it's almost like sometimes you, maybe you sometimes try and write for different audiences, but sometimes your audience is just yourself and you're writing something that you think is, you know, darkly humorous. Like, I don't know, I wrote a, I wrote a short story once about a spaceship that, develops a taste for human flesh and converts itself into this like giant intestinal tract so it can sort of digest all of the astronauts and to me that was really funny but then (laughs) other people read it they're like oh you've you're you know you've got you must be you must be sick to find that funny and i'm like oh well (laughs) i guess so well there's another part i don't know about spaceships but there's another aspect to this which is our characters and our characters you know sometimes they might remind us a little bit of you know, person A, B, C, or X. And um, we put them through their paces, don't we? And sometimes we're kind of just a little bit, um, you know, teasing them, sending them up, ridiculing them, whatever, or just making, giving them a hard time. So even when, yes. when a character might die tragically, we're laughing. You know, we've made them die. You know, we've given them that death. And it, we think it's hilarious because secretly behind that there's a bit of you know revenge or something you know yeah or you know he setting. he had it coming or exactly coming. that's exactly <laughs> it killing him off in, in ever more creative ways um well it, isabel thank you so much for your um for, for making an appearance today it's been an enormous pleasure to talk to you oh thank you i've had a marvelous time no oh, that's well that's really good that's what we like to hear um, is there anything else you would like to uh, share with the listeners in terms of, I don't know, whether you've got any social media contact details or, or anything you'd like them to be aware of? Well, I'm all over um, social media. You can find my website, isabelblackthorn.com. That's I-S-O-B-E-L and Blackthorn with no E. And I have a Facebook page. I'm on Twitter, Instagram everywhere really what's your twitter handle isabel i want to make sure i'm following you i think i am i blackthorn i like capital i capital b so it's i blackthorn i look i look suitably dark and mysterious and you know all kind of awfully in a noir kind of way good that's good that's good yes you see a lot of writers on there like trying to do that that sort of photo mine is like you know I'm half in shadow, and it looks like I've had it. Oh, your, yours is great. I really like but yours. I, I did it. I Literally, I was just in a cupboard with a torch. So it was like one hand on the phone taking a selfie, the other hand with a torch shining it onto the side of my face. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, I, I, had, um, I had some headshots taken professionally, you know, with the blurred background. Oh, brilliant. And what, but I don't like them. And I've gone back to my noir, uh. my noir photos that my daughter took she came over with her cam camera i think it, i think it was her phone actually and she did my makeup and she did my hair and we went out into my garden and she just took some photos and we picked the best couple and i'm just living with those they are brilliant and, and yeah camera phones now are so good quality anyway it's almost pointless isn't it paying for a posh camera but i don't well, know if especially camera... if they don't like capture your best side i mean you know we've all got we've got a best side don't we and we want that featured <laughs> would you say that your best side is your best side you or is your best side her downstairs her downstairs oh she's just unreal <laughs> she's fantastic i love her <laughs> she i'm she's half my age john i mean you know there's no contest <laughs> <laughs> that's, really, that's really funny i'm gonna i'm gonna ponder that one what does my my version of that look like i i genuinely have the first thing that sprung into mind is this sort of bald overweight sort of sweaty angry guy sat in like some sweltering kind of uh, cellar and he, he's been he's been kept there against his will that's that's what i think mine looks like so i don't know it sounds like you've got the better end of the deal on, on your side oh <laughs> uh, this sounds fantastic and uh, if you read stephen king's on writing in there he describes his muse and is very similar to yours but i think his one smokes a cigar oh okay okay well that is a that is another recommendation that you've made which i will definitely take um, as well as your upcoming book of course because that sounds that sounds really really good the ghost of villa winter <laughs>
the the ghost of Villa Winter. Yes. We'll, uh, that should be coming out in the next few weeks, actually. Oh, fun, that's awesome. Well, in that case, we'll, well definitely follow you on Twitter and those other um, other avenues as well for more news on that. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. No problem. And I will um, I will let you escape and enjoy the rest of your day, um, or which I think is your evening, if I've got my time zones right. You have indeed. It's 8 p.m. and um, on a Saturday night, so there's no telling what I might get up to now. Oh, there you go. You can go and celebrate. You've, you've escaped the Hall of Pain unscathed, relatively unscathed. That's definitely a topic to, you know, toast with a drink or three. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. <laughs> Cheers, Isabel, and um, we will wish you all uh, a good rest of day or evening or afternoon or whatever time of day it is that you're listening to this and see you all or speak to you all again soon for some more dark nattering. Goodbye. Thank you once again for listening to another episode of Dark Natter, and thanks also to Isabel, who was a great guest, as I'm sure you'll agree, um, and please make sure you do go and check out her stuff, um, as well as mine, of course, which I always plug, as is the traditional outro for this show, and this episode is no exception, so please do visit www.john-richter, that's J-O-N-R-I-C-H-T-E-R.com. You can also uh, just search for my name on Amazon to find some books that may be to your liking if you are a dark fiction fan. Um, please, 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 if you uh, enjoyed the show, do remember to leave us a five-star review on your podcast listening service. That's always helpful to get us a bit more exposure and just for our egos, basically, just make it all feel worthwhile. Um, and a final plug is for our newly revitalised YouTube um, channel, where we have recently uploaded the entire back catalogue of every episode of the show to date, as well as a couple of video episodes. So see, see how you find those. Might just be a bit of a change in format. Uh, that's it. That's the plugs concluded, and also the episode. We will be back in a couple of weeks' time with more dark, sinister musings. Until then, look after yourselves, and don't have nightmares. <laughs> <laughs>